Welcome to TSAT. Today I am going to discuss a topic in uh, geography regarding uh, agriculture. So here in this context, why this uh, part of economic geography uh, known as this agricultural geography or agriculture is being made part of uh, geography. The reason behind it is uh, in, in the context of uh, agriculture is considered, agriculture is being influenced by certain geographical factors. So, what are the geographical factors which influence the agriculture? Geographical, geographical factors like the types of soil, the climatic condition and topographical features uh, influence the agriculture. So, in this context, uh, climatic factors impact the availability of uh, precipitation or uh, water availability. So, depending upon the availability of the water, the agriculture is being uh, determined uh, in a region. So, apart from the availability of water, even the type of soil also determines the type of uh, crop need to be cultivated. So, all the soils are not equally fertile. You have got alluvial soil, you have got laterite soil, black cotton soil, red soil, sandy soil, desert soil. So, all the different variant types of soils have different variant types of mineral composition and organic composition is not the same which determines the crop need to be cultivated. So, the second factor after climate, it is the soil which determines the crop in a region. Apart from this, topographical features. So, in a region like Indo-Gangetic plain where the slope gradient is less, where there is possibility of stagnation of water, you can cultivate crops like uh, wheat or uh, rice, uh, sugarcane. So, these kind of crops can be cultivated. For example, in the uh, slopey, hilly slopey regions like the Western Ghats or the Northeastern states, uh, we can cultivate uh, crops like cash crops like tea, coffee kind of uh, crops can be cultivated. So, uh, so, here the topographical feature means the difference in the slope gradient. For example, mountain slopes in the Western Ghats and the northeastern states facilitate not only the cool climatic condition, facilitate a kind of well-drained uh, topographical feature which is essential for tea and coffee cultivation. So, let us examine in the case of Indian agriculture, how these uh, uh, agriculture is being influenced by different factors and how these uh, agri how this agriculture is influencing uh, Indian economy is going to be discussed with you. So, in this context, first we need to understand the physiographic features, how they are impacting the Indian agriculture uh, and the different variant types of soils distributed, how they are being impact impacting the agriculture. Physiographic features are responsible for uh, a slope gradient uh, and topographical features. For example, in the case of India, so the maps which are being uh, depicted to you or uh, projecting you, uh, showing you two different uh, themes here. One is uh, uh, highlighting the kind of soils, the other is uh, highlighting uh, the other is uh, highlighting uh, the uh, demarcating the different variant types of uh, topographical features. So, in this context, uh, the map which you have here, uh, major soil types of India, for example, we have got a different variant types of soils. For example, black soil, you have got this black cotton soil in this region, which is the resultant of uh, lava flow in this region, the red soil in this region. The alluvial soil uh, here which is present in the Indo-Gangetic plain and the coastal regions, east coastal regions, you have got uh, the alluvial soil and the laterite soil uh, is present on the hilly higher ridges of uh, uh, mountains or plateaus. Laterite soil is considered to be a poor soil in terms of uh, the fertility of the soil is being considered. So, the desert soils or the sandy soils uh, in the Rajasthan region, on the rain shadow region in the in the eastern side of the Western Ghats. Uh, so, these are the different variant types of soils which are present uh, in different parts of our country. For example, when you relatively compare with the alluvial soil which is present in the Indo-Gangetic plain 
and in the coastal plain regions uh, considered to be a fertile soil. Uh, the reason behind it is, it is the resultant of uh, the deposition being brought down by the great river systems like the Indus and the Ganges. In the process of weathering and erosion from the higher elevated regions, uh, they collect uh, the minerals of a different variant required uh, uh, nutrients essential are being deposited here, which are being collected from lakhs of square kilometers uh, through the weathering and erosion by the streams uh, which form the river systems, uh, where the minerals are collected from across the mountainous regions. Because of this reason, uh, these alluvial soils are fertile. So, whatever uh, the deficiency the soils are in, in terms of nitrogen, etc., are being given artificially through fertilizers, or through chemical and organic fertilizers. We have the knowledge of supplying the deficit of the soil, so that uh, we will be increasing the nutritional level of the soil. Obviously, the agricultural produce increases. So, here we have different variant types of soils. For example, take the case of laterite soil. Laterite soils are been, are the resultant of uh, a leaching process. Leaching is the process of uh, degradation and draining of the essential nutrients because they are being uh, uh, dried, heated by the sun's heat and at the same time they are being drained away by the flowing, uh, uh, flowing uh, streams and rivers from the higher elevated regions of the mountains, uh, dissolving the nutrients of the soil, leaving them sterile or infertile. So, but uh, this is a region where we are cultivating certain uh, cash crops like uh, uh, tea, coffee, etc. The reason behind it is the conditions essential to cultivate these kind of uh, cash crops we have got in terms of the temperature with the lapse rate with the altitude, in terms of well drained uh, topographical feature which is essential for tea and coffee. So, the deficiency is the uh, the deficiency is the fertilizer which we are supplying it to the crops. So, because of this reason we are able to even cultivate cash crops like tea, coffee, etc., pepper, tea, coffee, cardamom, etc. are being cultivated uh, because we are supplying the required essential nutrition. These are the poorest soils and we are cultivating here uh, the cash crops. So, to know about the Indian agriculture, we need to know about the conditions uh, of the different variant types of soil and in the Deccan Plateau region, in the Plateau region, the Peninsular Plateau region, we have got the black cotton soil which is the resultant of the degradation of uh, the lava plateau or the igneous rock uh, body. So, it is very famous for the cultivation of, uh, um, cultivation of black cotton, uh, red grams, sugarcane, these kind of crops can be cultivated in these uh, regions. So, the Indo-Gangetic plain as you know, it is famous for the cultivation of wheat, rice, uh, sugarcane. Uh, so, in the desert soils here, in the case of western Rajasthan, uh, uh, where the irrigation availability is very less, uh, uh, because of this we cannot cultivate huge amount of rice and uh, wheat. So, uh, you, we can cultivate crops which are based on uh, rain for, uh, rain fed uh, uh, irrigation. So, here in this process uh, what is done is for example, when the even this region when it is being supplied with irrigation for example, the classic example is uh, Indira Gandhi canal which has been made. So, in this region uh, the western part of the Rajasthan because of the construction of Indira Gandhi canal which has resulted in uh, increasing in the agricultural activity in this region. So, these are the different types of uh, soils present in our uh, country which are impacting uh, the agriculture. So, what are the different states, what are the different kinds of crops being cultivated? Let us examine on the basis of uh, the variation of different variant types of uh, soils in our country. So, <clears throat> next is uh, uh, a topographical features. So, as been depicted to you in the case of the topographical features, uh, for example, you have got the peninsular plateau, the northern plains, uh, the Himalayan mountain regions, the desert regions, the east coast and the west coastal regions uh, are the different physiographic features which we have got in our uh, country. In this context to understand, we need to understand the slope gradient. Uh, uh, of these regions. So, as been mentioned out of all these different uh, features been mentioned to you, here in the case of Himalayan regions, it has got a higher elevated, higher elevation 
because of which the water, the perennial river systems flow from the high elevated regions from the Himadri, Himachal, Shivaliks to the Great Plain regions. The Indus in the Jammu and Kashmir, Punjab region here flows to the west and the Ganges system flows to the south meeting the plain here. So, the, because there is a high slope gradient here, uh, the type of crops being cultivated varies in this region. So, here in the context of topographical features when the different topographical features are being demarcated here on the basis of the color. So, the violet color region is a higher elevated regions of the mountain regions which are responsible for creating a kind of slope gradient uh, to the southern parts of the Himalayas. So, the Himadris, the Himachals and the Shivaliks of this region are responsible for the draining of the uh, the great river systems like the Indus and the Ganges systems which flow to the south of uh, Himalayas. So, the Indus to the west into the Pakistan into the Jammu and Punjab regions and the Ganges to the plains of uh, UP, Bihar etc. and Bengal, the Ganges flows towards the east uh, after entering the plain regions. So, in this case, when you are able to relatively compare the altitude of these different geographical features which have been uh, depicted to you, the Himalayan mountains have the highest elevation. Next comes the peninsular plateau regions. The, the peninsular plateau region is the next uh, elevated region between Himalayan uh, ge physiographic feature and the peninsular plateau region. We have got a low lying physiographic feature known as the Great Plains region, which is the resultant of the depositional activity being done by the uh, great river systems like the Indus and the Ganges. So, the altitude of uh, the Indo-Gangetic plain is much more lesser than the Himalayas and the peninsular plateau. So, here the altitude uh, is more or less around 50-60 meters or uh, almost it is zero at the mouth of uh, Ganga and Hubli. Gradually, when it moves towards the west, uh, the altitude extends up to 150 to 200 meters. But in the case of Himalayas, uh, the greater Himalayas, the lesser Himalayas, the Himadris, the Himachals and the Shivaliks. Uh, Himadris have got uh, an elevation of around 5000 or 6000 meters on an average. So, 4000 meters, uh, 3 to 4000 meters in terms of Shivaliks and uh, Himachals. Shivaliks have got a 2000 meter elevation. So, obviously, always why the elevation is being mentioned is uh, you will be able to know the reason why uh, the directional flow of a river is being determined. Why? why this Ganges river system is flowing into northern plains is because of the slope gradient. For example, in the case of the peninsular plateau region, the peninsular plateau region has been divided into northern peninsular part and the Deccan peninsular part uh, based upon the, the range we have got uh, here. So, Vindhyas and Satpuras, the range is divided. So, the northern part is tilted uh, towards the north uh, because of which you have the Son or the Beta rivers. Uh, which uh, forms the peninsular tributaries of Ganges. But the Deccan Plateau is being tilted from west to east. The slope is towards the east. That is the reason why the Godavari, Krishna, Penna, Vaiga, etc. flow from west to east because it is a tilted plateau, the tilted lava plateau. So, the elevation of the east and west coastal regions are much more lesser than the peninsular plateau and these pl plains are being formed because of the depositional activity being made by these river systems flowing respectively in terms of east and west from where in this region the western guards are acting as a watershed divide. Based upon this you will be able to know that uh, that why these uh, uh, why these uh, river systems are flowing in a specific direction based upon the slope gradient and elevation after understanding this. So, because these Himalayan uh, mountain ranges uh, as a ridge running across uh, almost all east west or in this orientation. So, northwest or to southeast direction more or less oriented uh, obstructs the southwest monsoons because of which uh, you see this kind of uh, a bent we have got uh, uh, in the northeastern uh, 
part of our country. This bend, uh, hairpin bend of this Himalayan range traps the monsoons. The Arabian Sea branch of the monsoon and the Bay of Bengal branch of the monsoon is being trapped here leading to saturation. And this is a region in the world because of this kind of bend uh, which is responsible for the maximum amount of uh, rainfall in the world. The Mausindram or the Chirapunji or the regions uh, in Meghalaya which receives the highest amount of rainfall in the world because of the monsoon wings, the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal branch of monsoons are being trapped here. And we receive the maximum amount of rainfall here in the eastern part of our country. By the time when we gradually move towards the west, the rainfall becomes minimum at the Thar Desert. The maximum is in the northeast, the minimum is in the Thar Desert. And in the same way here, it is being determined by the directional flow of monsoons and the physiographic feature of our country. Apart from this, uh, we have got uh, the Western Ghats here. So, the Western Ghats stop the Southwest monsoons. When the Western Ghats stops the mo Southwest monsoons, the Southwest monsoons have to cross the Western Ghats here. So, in this process, the Southwest monsoons are being subjected to an elevation and uh, it leads to saturation because of the lapse rate decreasing in the temperature and the addition of uh, water vapor by a continuous flow of wind from the Indian Ocean region leading to saturation. So, the western side of the Western Ghats receives the maximum amount of rainfall and the, by the time the monsoons cross the Western Ghats, by the time they reach the central uh, uh, region of this uh, peninsular region, the wind becomes dry and leading to the formation of a rain shadow region in this. So, whether a vegetation or agriculture is been determined by the availability of precipitation on the basis of this, the types of crops being cultivated in a region is being determined. So, because the heavy precipitation happens to the south of the Himalayan region, it, it leads to the formation of a perennial river system because there is an accumulation of a snow on the Himalayan regions because of decreasing in the temperature. So, uh, Himalayas receives precipitation in the form of snow in the winter and in the form of uh, rain in the monsoon season leading to a continuous perennial, perennial river system. That is the reason why in the Indo-Gangetic plain because there is abundant availability of irrigation throughout the year in the Rabi and Karif, uh, uh, crops are being cultivated across the Indo-Gangetic plain extending from the Indus region in the Punjab and the Gangetic plain, UP, Bihar and uh, the Assam plain which is being drained by the Brahmaputra. But in the case of the peninsular plateau region, uh, here uh, the river systems are not perennial because they do not have a continuous supply of uh, uh, water because in the case of Himalayas, the snow melt in the winter feeds the streams. But, uh, the snow is absent in the peninsular India in the tropical region because of this reason these rivers are not as perennial as uh, the Himalayan mountain system. So, these factors of availability of water and the type of soil determines the agriculture in our country. The importance of agriculture in our country is 70 percentage of uh, the rural households are dependent upon the agriculture and a questions can be asked in this way. What is the percentage of contribution of uh, agriculture to the GDP? 17 percentage of uh, the agriculture is contributing to the GDP of our country and 58 percentage of the population in our country is depending upon agriculture. Uh, so, these can be given as a questions. Contribution of agriculture to GDP can be a question. What is the percentage of population depending upon agriculture can be a question. In this process, gradually what happened is because of any different factors, construction of different kinds of projects uh, and improvement in terms of technology, improvement in terms of irrigation technology, fertilizers, pesticides uh, and, and different uh, factors gradually what happened is the amount of agriculture produce has gradually increased to 250 million tons in 2011 and 12. But now after 2020, it has uh, even increased to 280 million tons of uh, food grains have been produced. So, gradually in 1950-51, it is just uh, 51 million tons. In 2011, it has crossed 250 million tons. Now, it has reached even 260 to 280 million tons in 2020-21. So, the GDP's contribution has increased uh, to 19.9% in 2021. 
to which from 17.8 percentage in 2019-20. So, here it implies that there is increasing in the contribution of GDP, but when relatively compared currently the percentage contribution of agriculture to the GDP, even though the percentage is low when relatively compared with the secondary sector and the tertiary sector, it does not mean that the agricultural produce has been reduced. When there is a percentage comparison of contribution of agriculture sector to GDP and secondary sector and tertiary sector to GDP might be less. But in terms of the total volume of production being made in terms of agriculture from 51 million tons to 280 million tons, in general it has increased, but relative comparison in terms of percentage might be low, but overall production of agriculture has increased. So, when a question is being framed, whether he is asking the percentage or in terms of amount in terms of millions of tons of food grains, be very clear while you are going through the question. So, uh, certain uh, data is essential to answer certain questions. India is the biggest exporter of cotton in the world. India is the largest producer of ginger, okra. Okra is otherwise also known as uh, uh, ladies finger in general, potatoes, onions, brinjals, etc. among vegetables. Sikkim has achieved 100 percentage organic farming might be a question. India ranks second in the world in agricultural production, uh, agricultural production in overall agricultural production considering all products, food grains, uh, vegetables, fruits, horticulture, cash crops, everything in total considered. Indian agriculture production has increased from 87 US dollar, 87 US dollar in terms of billions to 459 US dollars billion in the last 15 years. There is an annual increase of 12 percentage of agricultural production. This might be a question. Anything can be converted into in terms of amount of US dollars, in terms of billions. The percentage of growth rate of agriculture production can be an objective bit. So, it is 12 percent of annual growth rate. Globally, India ranks 9th for, for the agricultural export. So, in terms of the value, and India ranks 9th in terms of uh, exports of agriculture. A total of horticultural horticulture products in 2019-20, it has been increased to 310 million tons. So, here horticulture products consists of uh, there might be certain question in terms of what constitutes cash crops or food food grains cereals pulses so in this way what constitutes horticultural products horticultural products especially consists of fruits and vegetables so 310 million tons in 2019 and 20 uh, in 2019 20 india produced about 24 million tons of onions and exported around 2 million tons for it. So, there might be a question in terms of the exports of uh, onions. Uh, potatoes in 2019-20, the production is 51 million tons and tomatoes, it is around 19 million tons in terms of uh, vegetable production. As per estimates, total fresh vegetable pro uh, product, uh, production was about 97 million tons, about which 16 lakh tons of it was exported. So, any of these data can be converted into a question in terms of uh, lakhs of tons of uh, export of fresh vegetables from India. In 2019, India's livestock population rose to around 530 million uh, including uh, cattle, buffalo. So, all the cattle constitutes of 550 millions might be a question. India is the largest uh, milk producer and exports milk to these uh, uh, neighboring countries like Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, UAE and Afghanistan. In 2019-20, 190 million tons of milk was uh, produced. In terms of exports, India exports about 11 lakh million tons of buffalo meat, 14,000 million tons of sheep, goat meat and 3.5 lakh million tons of poultry products in 2019-20. So, this data can also be a used in uh, making an objective bits in terms of Indian agriculture. The current agro crop situation in India. So, India is the world's second largest producer of both uh, rice and wheat. Cultivation on 45 million hectares in Kharif and Rabi season. 
Price production has continuously rise over years from 1.4 million tons in 2015-16 to 117 million tons in 2019-20. So, they may ask you the amount of millions of tons of rice being produced uh, by India in these years. So, you must be able to uh, memorize certain data essential to ask such, to answer certain questions. Wheat a rabi crop is planted around 30 million hectares and its uh, harvest stood around 107 million tons in 2019-20 up to 92 million tons five years ago. So, in terms of the millions of tons of uh, wheat being produced and rice being produced, you must be able to compare. But in the case of uh, Indian agriculture in this process of cultivation, there is an increase in invisible costs. So, for example, because of improper methods of agriculture being followed, for example, intense use of chemical pesticides and fertilizers, killing the essential microbial biota in the soil, leading to increasing use of chemical fertilizers, increasing the cost and destructing the quality of the soil is a drawback in the method of agriculture being adopted by us. Encouraged by free power supply and reckless drainage of uh, groundwater, uh, reckless drawing of uh, groundwater for irrigation has resulted in the water table going down to alarming low level. So, because of indiscriminate use of uh, water, what is happening is uh, the alarming or the dangerous thing happening is there is decreasing in the level of uh, water table. So, significance of agriculture in Indian economy. So, agriculture in influences on a national income. So, uh, it is contributing around certain amount of percentage of GDP around uh, more than 17 percentage of uh, uh, GDP is being contributed by agriculture. So, uh, in the first two decades after independence, uh, it has contributed around 48 to 60 percentage to the GDP in terms of the development or the growth of India is uh, considered. Uh, later, even though the percentage is decreasing uh, relatively compared with the uh, rest of the sectors in general the amount of agriculture product from the independence decade to right now it is gradually increasing. So, agriculture play a vital role in uh, generating employment because two-thirds of the working population is dependent upon agriculture. Importance and significance of agriculture is it is providing food for ever increasing or exploding population is another significant aspect of uh, agriculture. Agriculture is also responsible for the capital formation. So, why, uh, what do you mean by capital formation? Capital formation means, for example, creation of uh, a kind of essential goods and resources uh, in a country or an economy is known as capital formation. So, because we want tractors to cultivate, uh, we, it need, we need to establish a kind of, uh, a kind of industries uh, uh, for manufacturing tractors, uh, fertilizers, etc. Certain kind of industries uh, need to be established. So, it is impacting other sectors for development, uh, which is being described as a contributor for capital formation. Support of uh, uh, raw material to agro-based industries. The supply of uh, raw material to agro-based industries uh, uh, led to the development of industries because of, uh, uh, because of uh, agriculture. So, what, what, is it, what is it doing is, it is supplying raw material. The sugarcane industry can exist only when there is a raw material being supplied from agriculture. Cotton industry, textile industry can survive only when there is cotton being supplied from agriculture. So, all these industries are dependent upon uh, agriculture is another significance of uh, agriculture. Uh, market for industrial production. So, Increase in rural purchasing power is very necessary for industrial development and two-thirds of the Indian population lives in villages. After green revolution, the purchasing power of the larger farmers has increased. So, what happened is because the per capita income after the green revolution in certain pockets has increased uh, because of which when they are when their purchasing power has increased because of agriculture, there is increasing in the industrial production. So, in this agriculture has impacted the secondary sector to develop. Influence on internal and external trade 
and commerce. So the produce which has been made surplus because of technology has made to uh, made to increasing in the agricultural products in terms of exports and distribution of trade across the country has increased which has led to increasing in the service sectors also. Uh, friends, uh, let us discuss the other topics of agriculture in the next uh, session. Thank you.